Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, and I do not know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said. So, if you have carried him away. Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic. Rabonia. Which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sadness. Our Lord the crucified has filled our hearts with gladness. My being shall rejoice. Secure within God's keeping Until the trumpet voice Shall wake us from our sleeping At Christ who once was slain Out burst his three-day Let's lost their cheer.
Jesus Christ our risen, our risen, our risen, but now has Christ our The season of Lent has come to a close, and today in homes around the world, people are celebrating Easter. I think it's safe to say that when this season began, none of us could have imagined quite how much we would be giving up for Lent. Instead of the usual routine of giving up a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, or even trying to develop a positive habit, our entire lives have been turned upside down. This season of extreme social distancing has been different for each of us, but it has been a stretch for all of us. For some of us, work has been busier than ever. For others, work has come to a standstill. We no longer see friends and family face to face, and even mundane outings like a trip to the post office or the grocery store have become major events requiring planning and protection. For all of us, Lent has been a season of disruption. This disruption has brought us many challenges, but it has also presented some unique opportunities. As we move further into this season of stay-at-home orders and shuttered businesses, people are beginning to see signs of hope, of curves flattening, of infection rates slowing, and people are beginning to discuss a little more what life will look like on the other side of this crisis. What does it look like to rebuild or restart after an event this globally disruptive? In the midst of all of these questions, Easter Sunday has arrived, reminding us of God's promise of resurrection and new life for all people. And while the focus of our celebration is on Jesus' resurrection from the dead, St. Paul reminds us that the miracle of Easter is much bigger than that. Jesus' resurrection is just a sneak preview of the much bigger rebuilding and reconstruction God has in store for us. In today's Gospel reading from John, Mary Magdalene goes to the garden tomb. It's still dark, and she discovers that the stone that sealed the tomb had been moved. Mary assumes that someone has stolen the body, and she runs to tell Peter and John. Then Peter and John run to see what happened, and we're told that they see and they believe, but we're not told what, maybe just that the body was gone, like Mary had said, and they both return to their homes. After John and Peter leave, we hear that Mary Magdalene remained in the tomb, weeping. The risen Jesus then appears to her, but she doesn't recognize him. She thinks he is the gardener and says, Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me so that I may have him. It's not until Jesus calls Mary by name that something clicks and she finally recognizes him. It has always been interesting to me that Mary, who definitely knew Jesus well, didn't recognize him when he appeared to her face to face. Mary had met Jesus years ago. He had freed her from several demons, and she quickly became a part of his inner circle. She was even at the foot of the cross when Jesus died, and so it seems extremely unlikely that she wouldn't have recognized Jesus when he was standing there face to face with her. So there must be something else going on in this story. Theologians tell us that John's was the last of the four Gospels to be written down. It's the most theologically distinct, and each part of John's gospel is very carefully constructed to communicate a particular truth about Jesus and about God. And I think his identity as a gardener here is an example of that. If I was to ask you what the most well-known story in the Bible set in a garden is, you'd probably remember the book of Genesis, where God creates the world and places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. John is wanting us to make this connection. At the very beginning of his gospel, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. We hear these words at every Christmas. 
They are John's version of the creation story. And devout Jews hearing them would immediately recognize this reference to creation and the Garden of Eden. And so here, towards the end of John's gospel, when Jesus appears and is recognized as the gardener, John's being poetic. He's wanting us as readers to recognize Jesus first as God incarnate, the cosmic gardener, and second as the person Jesus who came to live among us. In the Bible, gardens are a metaphor for paradise. In fact, the Greek and Hebrew words for paradise can be literally translated as garden of God. In the beginning of our Bible, that paradise appears as the Garden of Eden, and it's quickly overrun with the weeds and thorns of sin. Paradise appears again at the end of our Bible, as God resurrects and restores that garden once and for all. And between these two stories that begin and end our Bible with images of a garden stands Jesus, the cosmic gardener, who comes to heal and tend our broken and hurting world. When we think about Easter then, resurrection is not simply an event that happened once in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. It's a process that began at the dawn of creation and whose impact continues to reverberate through our world even today. Even here now, God is sowing the seeds of new life and resurrection in our world. I think everyone knows that life on the other side of this pandemic will look different. And it's up to us whether that different is an improvement. Two things for us to think about this Easter are how many of these seeds that God is planting will take root. And what can we do to nourish them? In an essay on the development of seeds, the science writer Hope Yarin says that putting down roots is the most essential thing a plant does for its survival. No risk, she says, is more terrifying than that taken by the first root. A lucky root will eventually find water, but its first job is to anchor. Once the first root is extended, the plant will never again enjoy any hope of relocating to a place that's less cold, less dry, less dangerous. Indeed, it will face frost, drought, and greedy jaws without any possibility of flight. She calls taking root a big gamble. But if the seed takes root, it can go down 12, 20, 30 meters, and the results are powerful. The tree's roots can swell and split bedrock. They can move gallons of water every day for years, better than any man-made pump ever could. And if the root takes root, then the plant becomes all but indestructible. Tear apart everything above ground, she says, everything. And most plants can still grow back, sometimes even more than once. God's timeline is almost always longer and more far-reaching than we can imagine. Sometimes we don't fully understand the implications of events that we live through until long after the fact. And this pandemic is one of them. When we think about paradise or heaven, we often assume that it is a far-off place, somewhere completely different from where we are now. And when we approach our faith and our religion in that way, the goal becomes to launch ourselves from here to there, escaping this world for a better one. But what I love about this Easter story and the image of Jesus as a gardener is that it reminds us that the seeds of paradise, of God's new life, are sown right here in our midst. At its core, our faith is in a God of life, in a God who comes to tend the many broken and hurting souls in our world. And when we see this happening, and when it happens to us, we get a glimpse of resurrection. And in these many little resurrections, the divine gardener plants seeds of life and calls us to nourish them. On this Easter, we give thanks for the many ways that we have seen God at work 
in our world. In our fight against COVID-19, in emergency rooms, in intensive care units and nursing homes, in the volunteers of our fire department and first aid squad, in the selflessness of those who volunteer to go shopping for the vulnerable members of our community, in the generosity of those who support our nonprofit partners like Nourish New Jersey and the Mental Health Association, and in the many ways, big and small, that all of you are intentional about reaching out and staying connected. One of my favorite authors, Anne Lamott, writes that we are Easter Christians living in a Good Friday world, and that feels especially true this year. God is alive and at work in our world, but there is still a lot of work for us to do. The seeds of new life are being sown. Our challenge is to find them, to help them take root and to grow. Because if we do, we can be certain that our community and our world will emerge from this crisis stronger and more vibrant than ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi, happy Easter everyone. I'm Matt Sheely, Chairman of the Mission and Outreach Committee. These are unique times, especially for those who are poor or sick. Now, it may surprise you to know that despite living in one of the wealthiest counties in the country, Morris County has a significant underprivileged population. The charities behind me do a tremendous job helping people by offering free of charge critical services. And in turn, our church does a wonderful job supporting these nonprofits. Did you know that we give almost 15% of our annual income to these nonprofits? And that doesn't even count the additional giving that many of you do. And as an example of additional giving, in the last two weeks alone, we donated $7,500 to three of these charities. That's a tremendous outpouring of love to these charities. And I wanted to thank you for that. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, these are unique times, uniquely challenging times. Our nonprofits need our help. They are serving an ever-expanding number of people. So I want to ask you to consider giving a donation of any amount earmarked to the charity of your choice to our church. Now, why do I ask that you give the donation to our church and in turn the church gives it to the nonprofit instead of just giving it to the nonprofit directly. Well if you give it to the church it will allow us to track how we are doing as a church in meeting the commitments to minister to the needs of the poor and the sick in our community. I want to promise you every dollar that you give us will go to the charity you designate. Just tell us when you make your donation what charity or charities you want the money to go to. You know, it's easy to donate. You can simply go to pcnv.org, click on Give, and then Online Giving. You'll find it's fast, it's easy, and it's secure. Or you can just drop a check off at the church. Thank you for listening, and I hope you and your family have a blessed Easter.
Will you please join me in prayer? God of joy, we give you thanks for this Easter Sunday. Our celebrations are different this year, but we celebrate still, coming together with the faithful of every country, celebrating the miracle of Jesus' resurrection. God of creation, we thank you for this season of new beginnings. As we celebrate Easter, we remember that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection all bear witness to the new covenant you have made with us. We are challenged to see and do things differently, to live in a way that helps the seeds of new life that you are planting take root. God of hope, we give you thanks for this challenge and for the chance to reflect this day on how we might share this love with one another and together make God's life-giving kingdom a reality in our world. God of the seasons, we remember with Isaiah that your thoughts are not our thoughts and that your ways are not our ways. And as we celebrate this morning and marvel at the many ways in which your love is clear to us, in the Bible, in our world, and in one another, we pray for the many places in which it seems to be lacking. We read of a time to be born and a time to die, and pray for those loved ones we have lost to illness, to age, to war, and to reasons known only to you. We read of times for planting and uprooting, for killing and healing, and we pray for peace in our world. Peace in the balance between our need for natural resources and the health of the Earth's many ecosystems. We pray for peace in the balance between our bounty and the neediness of so many in our country and our world. And we pray for peace in the many places where balance seems elusive, where towns, villages, and cities struggle to meet the increasing demands on their healthcare systems, where hospitals are full and supplies are short, where people struggle to find food and clean water or even a safe place to sleep. Where bills pile up and jobs are in short supply. Where families are evicted from their homes. And where it seems like there will never be a time when our weeping might turn to laughing. All of these things and more weigh heavily on our hearts, Lord. We pray for your new making love to be found in these places and in these people. And we pray that we might be its ambassadors, sharing the good news of Easter, that there will be a time when hate gives way to love, and those things given up as lost will indeed be found. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, risen at Easter and with us still today. Amen. Thank you for joining us. May God be with you. And may God bless you.